Thank you for joining the Daily Focus. This is an extension of our teaching ministry at Dimming FBC. You can find more resources at fbcdimming.com and join us on Sundays as we devote more time to our study of God's Word. Join with me today in Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 17. Scripture says, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up. Verse 17 will be a statement that Paul will unpack in in chapter 4 of Romans. And as you study Paul's writings, you'll see that he takes a a parenthetical expression. And like a lawyer, he will make it into a contrasting argument that lasts for pages. The statement of verse 17 is simple, though, that the righteous will live by faith. From there, Paul will begin verse 18 of chapter 1 and carry on through chapter 3, ending his argument with the the cubby Awana verse that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Chapter 1, beginning in verse 18, describes God's wrath against sin. And Paul begins by saying that the wrath of God against the Gentiles is justified. They could have argued the Jews got the law, the prophets and the promise, and therefore the rest of the world should be graded on a curve. Paul said that isn't so because the truth of God is still obvious. Look at verse 19. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. God's existence is obvious. And Paul will point for two reasons. Number one, look around, Paul says. If any chapter in the Bible is under attack the most, it's Genesis chapter 1. That in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The world hates that chapter. And will even bend the laws of nature or bend the laws of their own science in an attempt to disprove it. Paul writes this 2,000 years ago and says that by just seeing creation, you're obligated to believe in a creator. Science will tell you that that things went from disorganized to organized, that creation moved from chaos to creatures. But, But the laws of science do not apply to such things. The universe slips in the other direction. We are not seeing more creatures come into existence, but creatures becoming extinct. Take your most colorful shirt in your closet. Set it aside for 20 years. Either set it aside in your closet to the back or or better yet, outside. And And when you take it out or when you look at it again in 20 years from now, what are you gonna find? You're gonna find that the colors have faded. The material is weakened and it has decayed. So then, the best argument that the world offers against Genesis 1 is, is evolution, that our complex systems have grown from simple organisms. But Paul Taylor stands on science's laws of, of thermodynamics to say that, he says, and I quote, in a long run, complex ordered arrangements actually tend to become simpler and more disorderly with time. There is an irreversible downward trend ultimately at work throughout the universe. Evolution, with its ever-increasing order and complexity, appears to be impossible in the natural world. Paul said that the fact that God is creator is plain and that God has shown them. Meaning that if a person was never told that in the beginning that God created the heavens and the earth, they would still know as a resident of the universe, that there is a God more powerful than all that is created. For us in Dimming, it's the wind that seems most powerful. Every year, people donate trampolines to their neighbors, trucks are blown off the road, and school is released early. How foolish would it be to not believe in the wind? One could say, well, I've never seen the wind. Another could say, I don't understand the jet streams. 
or how the seasons change. Therefore, I do not believe in the wind. Step outside in Luna County in March and April, and you will believe that the wind exists. In a greater sense, consider that we are placed close enough to the sun that we don't freeze, far enough from the sun so we don't fry. Our planet is tilted to give us predictable seasons and spins to give us perfect days. And we are moving fast enough to be held down, but slow enough not to be sucked in. Yet in all of that, they exchange, the Gentiles exchange, and our societies exchange, and ignore the obvious fact that there is a Creator, and they exchange the glory that the Creator deserves. Exchange the glory of the Creator and worship the lowly creation. Have you seen this? Maybe this is you. Scripture says that your denial of God is without excuse of because because of what is seen, the external factors in your life. But Paul puts a, a book into this argument all the way down in verse 32 to say that there's also an internal reminder of God. Verse 32, though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. This is the conscience that's within each of us. It's our moral compass to know right from wrong. Why do we feel guilt when we do wrong? Why does our society agree that murder is wrong or killing puppies is twisted? And the list goes on. It is because God has programmed every person with common grace to know right from wrong. They know God's righteous decree. Putting both the external and internal together, we have a God that is more powerful than all creation who has a standard for living that has rules and, and boundaries and order, when you dwell on that, that God is more powerful than than the greatest hurricane and sees what you do and measures what you do against his standard of right and wrong, then it should make you shudder. It makes me shudder. Remember the purpose of the book was likely that Jews and Gentiles in the church were likely in in constant disagreements. And at this point, the Jews were likely pointing their fingers at the Gentiles. That's right. You were all sinful. Chapter 2, as you read on, will humble the Jews. But for today, our application here of chapter 1 is simple. Repent. Though God is invisible, His creation points to His power. And our conscience points to his standard. Remember verse 17 where we started? It said that the righteous shall live by faith. Righteous? You mean to tell me that someone has met God's standard? Just one person. And that was Christ. But he died as if he had broken every command of God. So that you and I can live like we've never even broken one. You can live in righteousness and forgiveness. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you. I pray for those listening today, and I pray for their time and their study in your word. I pray that they would seek after your truth, truth that is obvious, Father, that you are creator, and that you have a standard for right and wrong. And in all that, I pray that we would search and thirst for Jesus Christ who offers forgiveness. In Jesus' name, amen.